So I'd like to hand over to our speaker for today, which is John Wilkinson from the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust, who is going to be talking to us all about their new monitoring project that they are just launching. So pass over to you now, John. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Beck. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. So this talk is called Conservation and Monitoring of British Amphibians and Reptiles. And I work for Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust, as Beck said where I have the very long job title, which isn't reflected by my salary, unhappily. So what we're going over today will be looking at the various species that we have, starting with our rare amphibians, rare reptiles, some widespread species, and a few other species to tag on. Then I'm gonna look at what priorities amongst those are for monitoring, and finally, we'll talk a little bit about how people can get involved in the efforts to monitor these things. So jumping straight in then, uh, our first species uh, is a rare amphibian. It's the pool frog. It's the rarest amphibian or reptile in the whole of the UK. They actually became extinct here in the 1990s. There was one left for a while called Lucky. Unfortunately, he wasn't Lucky. We never found him a, a wife. and uh, pool frogs in the UK are now reintroduced from Sweden actually to two sites in Norfolk which are quite secret. I could tell you where they are but unfortunately I'd have to kill you and they are genetically distinct from nearby continental populations which is why we used animals from Sweden to repopulate England because uh, Scandinavian pool frogs are the closest ones to the ones that we used to have, and that took quite a lot of research to work out. They are also, as you might imagine, to ongoing conservation. They're still critically endangered here, uh, and one of the techniques we use is called head starting, which is collection of eggs and tadpoles, which are then raised up um, for a while in captivity and then be released so that they have a better chance, and that's been working quite well so far. However, there are only still a few hundred of these in the wild in the UK. And they're what we call uh, a European protected species, although that status uh, may have technically changed since Brexit, which I'm not going to talk about or mention again. Our next one is the Natterjack toad, really rather nice little toads. These, um, Paler in colour than the common toad, often with a yellow stripe down their back and always distinct because they have green or yellowish eyes as opposed to the common toads, orange or red ones. They're also our only native species to have a single vocal sac. So they're quite loud animals, natterjacks. And in the breeding season, the males call very loudly using this single vocal sac. Natterjacks have extremely specialised habitat needs. They're not a common species at all. They live mostly, mostly on dunes, in dune slacks, on heathland and in some management. They've been reintroduced into former sites, for example, in the North Wales coast. And unhappily, one of the reasons they're not as common as they might be is that they're easily outcompeted by other species. So frog or common toad tadpoles um, occurring in Natterjack sites tend to outcompete them very easily. And of course, they need quite a lot of management. Unlike many of our amphibians, which like woodlands or uh, other, uh, how shall I say, uh, highly vegetated habitats, Natterjacks really like very, very close cropped grassland, duneland, and very short swords to live in. So that needs a constant attention. Again, another European species. Uh, next, we have the sand lizard, our rarest lizard. That's a, a dune race animal. So animals on heathland look a little bit different to that. Um, those are the places that they mainly live. Again, reintroduced. Uh, especially in places like the Welsh coast. And of course, one of the reasons they're called the sand lizard is they need patches of bare sand in which to lay their eggs. Uh, and just about everywhere that this uh, is needed, um, the tendency is for habitats to become overgrown. So again, they need constant management, especially on places like Heathland. And we have a team of field staff that go out in the summer and um, 
basically remove the surface vegetation to create these bare sand patches to make sure that the sand lizard populations survive. Again, European protected. And uh, just to show you a picture there of a female sand lizard, very characteristic of this species are these what we call ocelli or eye spots. I think they look a bit like inverted fried eggs actually along the sides of the body. Uh, female sand lizards don't go green in the spring, unlike the males. Lastly is the smooth snake. There's a smooth snake. They are uh, our rarest snake and actually a very small species of snake, only about 60 centimetres long maximum. They're only found uh, on and around southern English heaths. Uh, they give birth to live young, but the reason really that uh, they're so restricted in their distribution is that their favourite prey is actually other reptiles, which need those warm heathland habitats to have large populations. It's a very, very secretive species, um, often burrows, very rarely seen out in the open, and therefore needs a very dedicated monitoring effort. Um, in fact, it's such a secretive species, it was only actually discovered in the middle of the 19th century, one of our more recent additions uh, to our reptile fauna. European protected. So uh, a quick whiz through uh, some of our commoner species now. So the common frog, which most people are familiar with, very variable species. The one on the top left there being a very typical color, yellowish brown with black markings, but you can get all sorts of variations, uh, including sort of very reddish ones like the one on the right. It's our commonest amphibian or reptile. Um, it has declined in the wider countryside, especially places like farmland, where there are many fewer ponds than they used to be. But happily, it does benefit from the popularity of garden ponds. I've certainly got enormous numbers of frogs in my garden uh, in all shapes and sizes. Um, just a, a, an indicator, if you, if you find tadpoles, uh, frog tadpoles are speckled and they often hide in mud and weeds at the bottom of the pond. Um, this is mainly because they're very tasty to a lot of things uh, and it's a good strategy for them to keep away from potential predators. Unfortunately, they don't really have any protection. Um, common toad now, that's a male on the left and a big old female on the right. The male's doing what I call a sentinel behavior. So it's basically sitting by the side of a road there keeping his eye out for females on the way to the breeding pond. They are still widespread um, across mainland Britain, but many declines have been recorded, especially in central and southern England. And although uh, some of these can be attributed to road traffic, um, it is a factor, but it's not the only reason. Habitat change and fragmentation and interruption of migration routes are probably at least as important as actual physical death of toads on roads. In contrast to frogs, if you see a big school of tadpoles swimming around the edge of a pond, which jet black, they will be toad tadpoles because toad tadpoles already have the distastefulness that the adults get. Uh, and they're, they're a little bit more happy to be out in the open and you'll often see them by the sides of ponds uh, basking in the sun. Because of its declines, uh, this toad is one of the species that we regard as biodiversity priorities. However, it doesn't unfortunately mean that they are protected and that they gain any um, um, protection from developments, for example. You can actually uh, destroy toad ponds, unfortunately, still. Let's look at the newts now. There's a, a male smooth newt. And you can always tell a smooth newt because they have a smooth wavy crest. And males only, that is. Our most widespread newt. Quite common in garden ponds, depending on where you are in the country. Commonest in England than, than elsewhere in the UK. Females are very much plainer. I'll show you a female in a while. Uh, and have smaller spots and they don't have the crest, of course. And they don't really have any protection, unfortunately, either, except in Northern Ireland, where all species are actually protected. 
Our other small newt is the palmate newt. Again, I'm showing you a male because it has most of the features that you would expect to see in this species. Um, the only species of newt to have a noticeable filament on the end of its tail and called palmate, of course, because of its big uh, boxing glove back feet, which it waves at females to show off their prowess during the mating season. I always think of palmates as the Celtic newt because they're commonest in, uh, for example, the southwest, places like Dartmoor, in the Welsh hills and in Scotland, and also found in Jersey. Um, they are more tolerant of living in uplands, uh, especially including acidic and shady ponds, which are less preferred by other newts that prefer neutral or alkaline, slightly alkaline ponds to live in. However, uh, in regular ponds, you know, the, the pH is, is neutral and it's not too shady, etc. If you get more than one species of newt in that pond, the palmate will do less well than others. So rather like the natterjack, they're easily outcompeted. They're not uncommon, uh, but again, have no protection. And there is a female newt. Now I happen to know that's a palmate, but female smooth newts look very, very similar. And um, identifying female newts is, is probably the biggest problem in identifying our UK species. And we run whole courses on this, as you might imagine, to help people do that. The last newt then, it is widespread. The great crested newt, totally different than the other species, can grow up to sort of 15, 16 centimetres in size, has a jagged rather than a smooth crest, and is much, much darker in colour than the smaller newts, with a very prominent uh, orangey, yellow, heavily spotted tummy. Females look exactly the same, except without the crest, really. So it's a European protected species because it has declined possibly by as much as about 50% uh, in the last few decades, but it's still widespread and in places actually common at the moment. UK populations are internationally important. We have more great crested newts than a lot of other countries, which is one of the reasons they gained such a level of protection. But unfortunately, they are much more sensitive to changes in habitat than our other newt species. Uh, great crested newt tadpoles tend to swim around in the open water and therefore um, very much uh, susceptible to being predated by fish, water beetles, dragonfly larvae, etc. And of course, where developments occur in places where there are great crested newts, they can be seen to be causing issues. But I would say to any potential developers, try and build your holding estates on places where there aren't great crested newts and save yourself a whole heap of money. Widespread reptile Our most widespread is the viviparous lizard. Uh, you can see from the pictures, it's a very variable animal typically sort of brownish or greyish in colour, but you do get greenish, melanistic and also bluish individuals and they're often mistaken for other species. Um, again, protected in Northern Ireland and like all reptiles, it's a biodiversity priority. Um, I've seen a number of uh, bits of research recently about declines uh, in other European countries, but we also suspect that this is going on in the UK. I'll come back to that later on. So really, as a species that ought to be common just about everywhere, potential declines in your viviparous lizards might well be indicative of broader problems in habitats, especially things like fragmentation, where animals can't find each other anymore, unfortunately. The slow worm is uh, one of our most familiar species. It is, of course, a legless lizard rather than being a snake, and we can tell that for at least because it has eyelids. It's widespread in some places, but very secretive. Uh, it burrows. Uh, there aren't many slogans here where I live because we have clay soil, but where the soil's more friable, sandier, um, you often get quite good populations of slow worms. Uh, it gives birth to live young and, again, is a priority. 
and it's happily benefiting from gardens rather like the common frog especially compost heaps because they will go and live in compost heaps and benefit from the heat that they generate so always be, if you have a compost heap where you're actually making compost i've got a compost heap but i don't use it for making compost <laughs> uh, just be careful when you're turning those over it is quite difficult to say what the status of slow worms is and, and also how to track any changes in status that might be on the go by the slow worm because um, being so secretive, you actually need to use uh, specialist surveys at, with refugia to actually detect and count slow worm numbers. So that's one of the, the reasons that targeted monitoring benefits our species, to be honest. Looking at grass snakes now, there's a grass snake. You can always easily tell a grass snake because they're our only species that has sponsorship by McDonald's uh, with the golden arches bordered by black on the back of the head. Some people think this is a V for viper, but it isn't. I can assure you anything with a black and yellow collar is a grass snake. It's our largest reptile. And if they're lucky enough to live long enough, they can go over a meter in length. They're very interesting uh, biologically because of their ranges. They're very much a creature of the landscape and they need lots of landscape features, uh, including places to hibernate. They need compost heaps or muck heaps in order to lay their eggs in. And also they need places to go and find food. So their favorite food is fish and frogs. They like ponds. Um, ponds are not necessarily located near hibernation sites or compost heaps. And actually you find that uh, they very often have ranges of several square kilometers. So they use lots of different features within the landscape. And one of the things that really limits where you find grass snakes is nice warm places for egg laying. Um, the distribution in the UK more or less stops at the English border, it's, uh, with Scotland that is. Uh, it's quite cool above that and there's lots of debate as to whether sightings of grass snakes in Scotland are actually real or not. If you have photographs of a grass snake from Scotland, we'd be very interested to see those. Our last widespread species then is the adder. Totally different to the grass snake. Always tell an adder by its zigzag markings. They are, of course, venomous. And this has created a lot of problems for them, especially in the past. Whole areas of the country have no adders because of historical persecution, um, especially for things like uh, game bird production, where they've been wiped out systematically. And they're still quite misunderstood, to be honest. They are a, a very shy, secretive species. Uh, and populations are, can be difficult to monitor, but they're often very fragmented and sometimes extremely small. Adders can live quite a long time, and uh, it may be that some populations of adders persist with only very old animals that aren't reproducing, and they gradually decline to extinction, and it's one of the species that we're most worried about. They can also suffer, especially if land managers don't know that they're on their sites, from poor habitat management. Um, for example, hibernacular hibernation sites can, can get damaged by regular management, which benefits other species. And sometimes it's too late before we know that that's happened and the adder population again declines to extinction, which is very sad. Just looking at a few of our other species. So those species that we've covered are our 13 native amphibians and reptiles. But if you add in Jersey, which is, of course, part of the British Isles, you get an extra four species. One of which is the adder frog. This is a great conservation success story, actually. It had declined to one pond on the west coast of Jersey, but like the pool frog, uh, has been subject to a head starting program. And uh, the last time I was happy enough to be there, I saw quite a number of agile frogs, which was great to see. And they are now in more sites as well. So that's very, very good. They look very much like common frogs, but have much longer uh, and more agile back legs. And the other amphibian in Jersey is the western toad or crapo. Looks very similar to our toad in inverted commas, the, the normal UK English toad. Um, however, they are just about as different as human beings are from gorillas. 
um, and they have a slightly different breeding biology and life cycle. They breed very early in the year, for example. Toads are culturally very interesting for Jersey as well. They're more or less the national animal. Uh, Islanders are very proud of their toads. And in fact, they have a big bronze statue to a toad in St. Helier there, uh, surrounded by words from Jersey laws um, uh, to just emphasize how important they find this species. One of my favorite animals, to be honest. In terms of reptiles, um, one of the species found in Jersey and nowhere else is the Western green lizard. Uh, females tend to be green and black with a couple of uh, white stripes. This is a big old male that used to come out and glare at me when I was doing surveys in Jersey. And when they get sexually mature and as they get older, they tend to get this really rather wonderful blue coloration around their heads. Um, something else that's benefited a lot from conservation attention is the green lizard. And the last one is the wall lizard, only found in a few coastal sites in Jersey, um, not as common as it used to be. And the reason I would end on native species there is that those two species are also introduced in several populations in the British mainland, mainly on the south coast, but there are uh, increasing numbers of reports of war lizards from different parts of the country, uh, and one of the species that's uh, doing very well as our climate warms up. So that leads nicely into looking at other non-native species, of which there are many very well established in the UK. Uh, just to mention a few of them, this is an Aesculapian snake, one in London and one in North Wales. Similar or closely related to grass snakes and the young animals do have yellow markings, but they are more arboreal. This species mainly eats rats and mice and probably isn't doing any damage at the moment, but it's something we'd like to be sure of. Another is the alpine mute. Uh, a very, very attractive species. This is a male which tends to be uh, blue in colour, so you can't really mistake them for other newts. There are at least 40 locations in the UK for these, some of which are quite large populations. So all the way from Cornwall up to, up to Edinburgh, um, there are populations of alpine newts dotted around everywhere. They're a very, very adaptable species. Uh, unfortunately, they can carry diseases which affect our native amphibians. <laughs> Uh, then we're on to uh, what I like to call green frogs, also known as water frogs. There's about six different species of these introduced to the UK. They are related to and can hybridise with pool frogs, so it's something we need to keep an eye on. The ones in the picture there happen to be marsh frogs from Sussex. They were first introduced into Kent in the 1930s, just a few, um, but now they're found more or less all over Kent and Sussex and becoming increasingly common elsewhere in the country as well. Quite a big frog with a very, very loud call, these are. And lastly, the humble midwife toad, uh, not really closely related to our native toads, uh, quite a small species, very interesting biology. Um, in the breeding season, they mate on land and the male then wraps the string of eggs around his legs and carries, the carries them around looking after them, keeping them moist and, until they were ready to hatch. And then he'll find a suitable pond, um, stick his rear end in the water and the tadpoles hatch out and swim away. 10 or 11 sites for those in the UK, um, from Wales up, up in places like Bedfordshire, which is one of the first places where they were recorded as being introduced. Hopefully, and I keep my fingers crossed with this, hopefully not having any impacts on native species, that particular one, seem to be very susceptible to amphibian diseases themselves, something that we're constantly looking in to make sure. Excuse me. So what are our monitoring priorities then? Well, as you might imagine, all the rare species, all the species that we would have called European protected are monitoring priorities. There's an obligation to do it at the moment by the UK government, and also they have very specialised habitats and often a restricted distribution. So they're susceptible if those habitats are lost. One of the things we also monitor, of course, is the condition of those habitats and how that might be changing. 
and if then what impact it has on their populations. The non-native species are priorities for monitoring as well. We don't know what their impacts are in all cases, whether they're having impacts, but they might easily conclude things like competition, predation directly on native species, but also the spread of diseases is a very important factor emerging. We've got at least two or three significant amphibian diseases in the UK at the moment, some of which are causing extinctions nearby in places like Belgium and the Netherlands. So it's very important to keep an eye on those. Um, we had, hopefully we don't anymore, we had populations of American bullfrogs at one time in England, which um, are very, very large and very, very capable of eating adults of other species. So that's another thing we need to keep an eye on. Hopefully those don't come back. But what I really want to emphasize in this talk is that there are new urgent monitoring priorities in our formerly common species. And these include particularly, as you might imagine, the adder and the common toad. But really, many of the other species are at least uh, as important because it's so hard sometimes to actually detect what the species is and whether it's going up, down, or we don't know. Um, this is one of the reasons we're launching our new monitoring scheme. And we ought to be looking really at including things like common lizard or the viviparous lizard in our monitoring priorities to make sure that the decline in biodiversity doesn't result in our species that we think ought to be widespread and common actually suddenly turning up one day as rare and people don't see them anymore. It's amazing the number of people I meet these days who still haven't ever seen a lizard in the wild. And that's something that we could do with changing, to be honest. So a quick mention of adders then. This is an adder in the, in the act of being monitored under a survey tin or refuge. Um, it's a very odd angled photograph, I know, but I, I was happy to find a picture of an adder or under a tin. The previous monitoring scheme, scheme that we had was the National Amphibian Reptile Recording Scheme. And it's very much informed the scheme that we're about to launch. Um, this took place over 12 years and unfortunately, we found at the end that adders had only turned up in 7% of the surveys that we'd carried out. This is in contrast to something like lizards, which we're also worried about, but they turn up in more like 30, 35% of surveys. So, you know, the adder, which was once, once, once common and considered widespread, is really something that we're very, very worried about. Um, and, and it's an urgent priority for monitoring. Likewise, the poor old common toad, you can tell that's a common toad, of course, because of its orange eyes rather than yellowy green eyes. Um, the declines in toads are enigmatic. ARC actually has a PhD student looking into this in the Midlands at the moment, University of Wolverhampton. And there are populations near to where I live, some of which are doing very, very well, including um, ones that are impacted by road traffic. And yet the one closest to my house, which was very common when I was a boy, has gone almost to extinction, unfortunately, and it's very, very hard for the reasons why this is. It's obviously something bigger going on. Um, it's important that we find out what it is and take steps to address it. So those are two of our most um, important monitoring priorities at the moment. And if all this has made you interested in conservation of amphibians and reptiles, which I hope it has, you may be wondering how you can get involved. Well, happily, there are many ways you can do that uh, at lots of different levels. So firstly, um, if you don't want to be, become involved in formal monitoring and give, a, uh, give up your time to go out and do regular surveys of ponds, etc., you can record any amphibians and reptiles you see on an ad hoc basis using a website that we've got called the Record Pool. And that's the address there. This is what it looks like. You do need to register to use this site. This is to stop people submitting spurious records or, or spamming the site. But um, whether you're from Dorset and go on holiday to Scotland and you see a lizard or the other way around, um, you can record uh, reptiles and amphibians from anywhere in the UK here. And as you can see from the stats on the homepage there, uh, there's already over 45,000 records in this. And, it's very, very useful for local recorders to know which species they have locally. So any ad hoc records are very welcome there. 
Similarly, uh, you can use a, a relatively new scheme that we have called Garden Dragon Watch. It was really a, a response to the COVID pandemic when we weren't able to say to people, go forth and, and do lots of surveys. Um, we thought, well, people are quite keen to be recording things, actually. What can they do? So we instigated this scheme. That's what it looks like. You'll find it on our website. And it's basically, as you might imagine, recording any amphibians and reptiles that you find in your garden. So whether you spot a newt or squiz a slow worm, you can actually just record them there whenever you see them. That's also a great way to get children involved in conservation recording as well. You can, if you're lucky enough to be near one, join in with our regional projects. Uh, there are several of these, and I won't go through all of them, but I'd like to highlight our South Wales project, which is called Connecting the Dragons. You'll notice a dragon theme going on here. And also um, something like our Snakes in the Heather project, Sith. I quite like to have projects that are named after science fiction franchises, but that's just a coincidence, really, to be perfectly honest. Happily, there's a snake in Heather. Both of these projects happen to be National Heritage Lottery Fund funded, so um, support them by playing your lottery every week if you can. Uh, but also do look at the website and see whether there's any other projects nearby to you that you might want to get involved in. There's things above mon monitoring involved in these, including habitat management, awareness campaigns for adders and all sorts of exciting stuff. Track down our little animation on the website of Adam the Adder if you want a uh, five minutes of fun. And uh, lastly, I think we've got our new national schemes, of course. We're very, very happy to be launching these very soon. Um, these will include the National Amphibian Survey and National Reptile Survey. They incorporate other data. So, you know, however you can or you want to be involved in monitoring, we will be looking at everybody's data to make sure we get as much information as we can on the status of our species. There are new protocols for this based on the former NARS scheme. There will be lots of new resources available on the website, including identification, training, etc. Said that already. And what we're aiming for over the next years is a network of monitoring sites which basically stay in the same place and people will be able to take ownership of these sites visiting multiple times in multiple years and we've discovered using fiendish statistics this is the best way of looking at uh, how status in species is changing and what we hope to do is detect any status trends any national trends as well as for example changes in habitat condition, uh, pond loss, and we should be able to generate enough data to look at these things at different scales as well. So if you want to know what the status of toads in Wales is, for example, in a few years time, we hope to be able to answer that sort of question. Advance a great leap forward if you want to use a, a froggy analogy, is that we're going to be using smartphone technology so that people can do real-time recording in the field and one of the things that helps with is reducing the time it takes for records of species to get from the recorder to the people sitting in a, in a, a dusty office doing the statistics to say what our species are doing and that's a, a great leap forward actually yeah so uh, this is a sort of um, screen you'll get um, once this is made available we can uh, give you training on this and uh, help you to get set up, help you set up your site, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but also, uh, if you're not a smartphone owner, it's not a barrier to taking part, you can do it in a conventional way too. There will be a dedicated area of the website with lots of resources on. And we've already had a small pilot running of this. We got some green recovery funding from the lottery earlier this year and managed to set up quite a few reptile monitoring sites in South Wales. This is great. Um, if those sites are now regularly monitored for the next few years, it will provide enormous amounts of information. What we need to do is replicate that, that scenario across the rest of Wales and across the rest of the UK. And then we can really start to answer some questions on which we can base more conservation decisions. And finally, of course, you'll want to know how you can actually take part. Well. 
again, happily lots of ways. For example, if you're already carrying out monitoring, so let's say you're looking at slow worms on a local nature reserve as part of a volunteer group, we can incorporate that into our new scheme. And if that's something you're interested in, you can email that address. Uh, by the way, these links are also in the chat of this meeting. The easiest way is to go to the website and sign up for our volunteer newsletter. And you can do that there. So there's an actual registration form, which is easy enough to complete. And more generally, if you want to find out more before you do that, have a look at the ARC website and uh, look at our projects and campaigns to see what's near you and different ways you can take part. And I think, as I recall, that's uh, more or less all I've got to say. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening and for everybody that came. But of course, I'm now happy to take any questions and I will stop sharing for a second whilst those questions are collated. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's great to hear how all of us can start getting involved in monitoring of our amphibians and reptiles, something important, definitely. Um, so I'll open the floor if anyone does have a question that they would like to ask to John. If you would like to use your little reaction button and put your virtual hand up, um, you can come ask it if it's you know about getting involved or um, something you've seen, you can um, come and ask your question now. Jules, did you have a question? I do. What yes, would be, go ahead, Jules. Hi. What would be the best way to encourage my slow worms and grass snakes in the meadow next door that we're just setting up? We just found them for the first time, really exciting, but they're in a daft place right by the entrance. Ah. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to encourage them further in where it's a little bit safety. They were under a green tarpaulin that we'd put over some uh -huh. shreddings. Well, I mean, um, you can you can have an almost instant effect by providing other refugia for them. So a, a green tarpaulin pro possibly isn't the, the, the ideal. OK, we use um, corrugated roofing felt is a brilliant um, thing and it's better than corrugated tin, which is what people always used to use. But there's a you know, people get cut on tins dogs get yeah. cut, for example sometimes so the roofing felt is a better option brilliant. but what's brilliant in a meadow environment is presumably there will be a cutting regime where they perhaps in september or october time we just uh, cut right good well the best thing to do is to not remove the the cuttings from the meadow and make a big pile hay pile yeah, a great big hay pile, which should be in a sunny spot facing south, ideally. And you will find that grass snakes will uh, use those for laying eggs and slow ones will go and live in there. That's really exciting. Thank you. Log piles are good as well, of course. OK. There's, um, there's actually um, um, a document on our website called the Reptile Habitat Management Handbook. Right. And you can download a PDF of that for free from our website. That's brilliant. Um, shall we go with Simon next? Do you have a question, Thank you. Simon? Simon Dundas, I think you're muted. Yes. Hi there. Hi. Uh, I install and renovate ponds for the last 12 years or so, and I've noticed particularly in the last year, maybe the last two years, a significant decline in the common frog. And I guess wondered if you know why that is. In my own pond, I'm normally, in the past, I've counted up to 90, and it's not a terribly big pond. It's about 13 foot long uh, in the breeding season. And uh, a neighbor spotted uh, what he said, and I thought he was exaggerating, but maybe not a, a, a meter long grass snake. And I happened to spot a baby grass snake about a foot foot long in my pond, which is the first one I've ever seen. Um, and I guess wondered if that's maybe as the one of the culprits. Well, they are very fond of eating frogs. Are they? But um, it's very unusual and people get very worried about their frogs sometimes when a grass snake turns up. It's very unusual for them to stay around very long for some of the reasons that I've suggested. You know, they'll only be in the pond at certain times of the year and they'll 
go away in the autumn time to find somewhere to hibernate or indeed in the spring to, to try and find somewhere to lay eggs. It would right. be unusual for grass snakes to reduce a frog population to extinction. It's more likely to be, if anything, perhaps there are newts in the pond eating all the tadpoles because that does happen. The other thing to say perhaps is that amphibian populations fluctuate an awful lot and you will get a lot of boom and bust within those populations. So what you saw previously might be at one of their boom phases and they're having a little bit of a bust now. So my advice would be to be quite patient and hopefully in three or four years time, you'll see the population going up again. Right. I mean, in, in my own pond, I've got masses of newts, so that could well explain maybe. And I, I guess what will happen is they've decimated, if they've decimated the frog population, their own population will go down next year and then the frogs will come back and exactly. it will cycle around. But it just seems a bit odd that a lot of most of the ponds that I've seen in the last year or two have got much reduced frogs compared to usual. So it's not just my own one. And I thought maybe it's linked to the weather or maybe I haven't seen any diseased frogs, uh, but the, maybe. The weather can have a, can have a factor. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. And again, you know, the weather patterns have been very, very odd uh, just recently. Right. So, you know, it, it could be, oh, this is a, a huge problem with amphibians. A, the populations fluctuate nat naturally but also they're subject to, to so many different influences it can be very hard to work out why something's declining um, right. with common frogs i always say to people hopefully they'll go back up again and we've okay. got a number of other questions including in the chat but i probably should go to dan because he's been looking at um various questions possibly in the chat and from elsewhere yeah i've got loads here loads and loads uh, i've got one from Kay. can you hear me guys just check in, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah brilliant, yeah. fantastic. Um, I've got a question from Kay um, asking, is there a potential to link up with butterfly transects and bee walks? She's saying she'd be happy to look for amphibians and reptiles along the same routes that she does those. There's absolutely no reason why that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, you might find that, um, unless you're looking in, in ponds at the right time of year, that reptiles are more easily incorporated into that. But if you've got a site where you're doing butterfly transects and bee walks where there are reptiles you absolutely can do a, a, a reptile survey um, as part of that and you know it's it's a, a great thing for conservation if we're, if we're trying to record and identify several different groups of animals at the same time I think everybody would agree with that um, I've got another one on um, recording as well. So I've got one from Debbie asking, do you take data from iRecord and the BTO Garden Birdwatch as she uses both for record amphibians in the garden? Uh, BTO Garden Birdwatch regularly share our data with us happily, yes. Um, we have talked to iRecord about sharing their records and I'm not sure that we've got anything in place for that at the moment, but let's say it's a very desirable thing to happen. That's brilliant. Um, I've got one from Lisa asking, why did the pool frog become extinct in the first place? Very specialist habitat. They live in a, a post-glacial landscape in the UK that's nearly gone altogether. Uh, and the, the ponds they live in are called pingus. No, pingos. I knew I was going to get that wrong. So yeah, that's how you remember it. So they're not, they're not pingus, they're pingos. And they're caused by collapses of, of where the, there was frozen soil. Uh, and as the, the ice sheets retreated, the, the land collapsed and these ponds were formed. But they became, in uh, the last recent decades, very, very overgrown and uninhabitable. And, and nobody thought that pool frogs were native for quite a long time, so they weren't given any attention. And just as the last one became extinct, unfortunately, we realised that they were um, almost unique part of our fauna, as I say, related only to these other Scandinavian ones, which aren't common by any means themselves. So that's basically why they became extinct. Happily now we're managing specifically for the bullfrog, so hopefully it won't happen again. Dan, I can't hear you now, Dan, muted, sorry. Dan. Oh, there we are, it's my magic microphone, sorry. Um, that was really good. I've learned a word for today, so that's fantastic. Uh, I've got a question from Graham. I'm assuming he's talking about hay piles, so if he's not, I apologise. Um, and he's asking, does the pile need to be of a certain size, ideally, to sort of help? 
Um, almost the bigger the better. Um, people, I have seen people creating piles for grass snakes and slowworms, and, and they've made lots of little small ones, but a, a, a bigger one is much, much better because it'll get hotter in the middle and create better conditions for grass snake eggs to hatch. And you've gone again. There we are. Um, I've got a question from Fal um, as well, and she was wondering if there are any particular habitats that might be particularly good for amphibians or reptiles, or if they're quite generalist in, in overall. Well, we heard a little bit about our specialist species, our rarer ones. In terms of the widespread ones, you can get um, most of them in a lot of different habitats, but heathlands are by far the best for the whole range of species. Um, in terms of gardens or nature reserves or local parks, what we really want is um, plenty of cover to provide shelter for things like lizards and slow worms and a pond, and you can replicate that in your garden, of course. These not only provide cover for the animals, but they provide cover for their food, which is mainly invertebrates. Um, so there we are. Um, I have another question, um, which was from Rosie asking about um, that she's heard about a disease that's been devastating amphibian populations in recent years. Um, is this a concern in the UK? Uh, well, very much so. And as I hinted, I could give a whole lecture on that probably on its own and um, it wouldn't necessarily interest everybody. But we have this quite widespread disease now called chytrid. I'm going to call it chytrid one for simplicity. Uh, and it's, it's endemic in alpine newts and quite often an, uh, other introduced species as well. There haven't been any recorded local extinctions of amphibians in the UK due to that disease, but there have been elsewhere in Europe, um, in other countries, and including especially places like Australia and Central America. So it is very much uh, a concern uh, and something everybody keeps an eye on. Unfortunately, we also have a thing now, which I'm gonna call Kittred 2, and it specializes in attacking newts and salamanders. And this is the thing that I referred to that's causing extinctions in Belgium and the Netherlands, where their wonderful fire salamander populations have declined by about 98% in the last few years. So that's a very, very serious concern it would almost certainly devastate our great crested newts if it got here. And it's something that um, we're looking into very closely and keeping an eye on, so yeah. That's really informative, thanks, John. Um, I've got another question in the chat, but I didn't know if um, the people that have been waiting very patiently with their hands up uh, want to go first. So, uh, Bob, do you want, have you got a question you want to ask? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, we, we have a garden pond that, uh, has over the years very successfully um, rated frogs with a large amount of spawn and a large amount of tadpoles maturing each year. But in the last two seasons, although there's still been a lot of spawn, um, they failed to um, mature into uh, tadpoles and develop. And uh, I don't know what's going on there. It, it, it seems to be between the egg and the tadpole stage. Uh, rather, than, rather than anything else. We, we don't have newts or anything of that sort to, to complicate the issue. It's, uh, so what ideas do you have? It's very, very hard to say. It could be uh, some kind of problem with the water quality or it could be something strange that you can't see. Um, so a neighbour spraying his roses too often or something and it drifting over. It could easily be something like that. I would say that... Um, Keep an eye on a, a website called Garden Wildlife Health, which might have some ideas about that. And if you do find uh, dead animals, you can contact them uh, for advice. And sometimes they'll ask you to send those animals in and, and they'll test them for the cause of death. But also, uh, especially if you haven't got amphibians, uh, maybe give the pond a good clear out and remove any sediment or mud at the bottom. Uh, just in case something's got into that, which is causing a problem for the, for the developing spawn. And obviously the time to do that is sort of October time when there's the fewest number of animals likely to be using the pond. Thank you. Um, Falguni, do you have your hand up? 
like to unmute yourself and ask your questions, John. Yeah. Yes, it's just, um, John, it's a similar question to the previous one. Um, I have a pond which is isolated and I get lots of tadpoles, uh, frog, uh, frog spawn, and then they get tadpoles and then few frogs, but lots of tadpoles remain without any change, any further, any no more development. And my question is what's going on? Well, again, it's very hard to say really, but it, it isn't uncommon, especially if it's a fairly cool pond, it isn't uncommon for frog tadpoles to actually take more than one year to develop. So as long as you haven't got any serious problems with your pond, such as chemicals, for example, you might find that those tadpoles do, do still develop over time. Uh, one question, um, do they, so I've seen some frogs which keep the, 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 um, the, the frog, um, the, the, some of the tadpoles and frog spawns for the developed frog to eat and grow. Is it something like that happening here? No, well, our species don't do that. That's a, a factor that you find in, in some tropical species there. It's unlikely that your, your tadpoles aren't developing because they're being eaten. Unless you've got a lot of mutes, of course. Which, which No, could be I happen. haven't, no. Thank you, John. Okay, you're welcome. Dan, did you have some more from the chat by any chance? No? <laughs> Just shaking your head whilst muted. Um, perfect. Well, if no, oh, Simon, do you have another question? Yes, please. Could I ask? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Do, do grass, I've heard that grass snakes eat frog spawn. Is that right? Or maybe tadpoles? Uh, sorry. Yes, grass snakes. So I've been blaming those for clearing out some ponds when people have said they've seen the grass snake. But is that I, I've never seen a grass snake eating frog spawn. No. But small grass snakes especially will happily eat tadpoles, yes. Oh, right, yes. And what about newts? Do they eat newts? Uh, grass snakes will eat newts, yes. Yeah. They just oh. love amphibians, to be honest. Yeah, right, okay. I've seen some very gruesome videos of the meeting eating frogs very large frogs yeah it's amazing i've seen a num on a number of occasions the frog actually gets away though oh right yes yeah yeah that, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a done deal the frog can get away oh good <laughs> right thanks very much it's been a very good uh, good talk thanks hi john i got um one last question um from amanda asking if the frog life um app records are still being collected and if so are will they be added to this project well i can answer that very quickly because the, the truth is i don't actually know whether they're still collecting records through that app um so it would be an ideal to incorporate any records that they do collect but i genuinely don't know if they're still doing that sorry about that Oh, um, I've got one more sneaky one, and this will genuinely be the last one, because um, I was meant to ask it a minute ago. Um, Lisa's asking, do the distributions of grass snakes and adders overlap? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, you can find them in the same hibernation sites sometimes, but they use different habitats for foraging. So in, in, in the same general area, let's say on the same nature reserve or in the same, uh, on the same woodland edge, um, the grass snakes will be going in the, in the damper areas where they're finding their uh, amphibians and fish to eat. Uh, adders prefer to prey on uh, voles and mice, so they'll be in the drier areas where they're finding their respective prey, basically. Mm -hmm. And you can find distributions maps of our species on our, the ARC website, by the way, if you're interested in actually where they're found. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, John. And as we said at the start, and um, we do have a course coming up in collaboration with ARC um, starting in October. So our Discovering Reptiles course, which covers a lot of what we've already spoken about, but then a lot more in depth as well. So if this is something you're interested in, definitely get yourself booked onto that and it'll be a great course um, created by the experts themselves. So you know you're getting the cream of the crop content there. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us. And um, it was really great to see you all. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Natural History Live. Thanks everybody.